Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another First Friday. Thank you for joining us this evening. First Friday is sponsored by the Woodside Arts and Culture Committee, made up of like-minded community volunteers, like many of you. And our purpose is to provide interesting and thoughtful and sometimes provocative um, programs once a month. So sit back and relax. This evening, we have a great one about one of our local treasures, my old lady. Well, hopefully, many of you have visited this real treasure, not just for us locally, but for the world. Um, and this evening's spokesperson is Jim. Jim is the director of Holoculture for Finally, he's been there for more than 20 years. The guy knows his plants inside and out. He knows what works well and what doesn't. And this evening, he's going to be talking about sustainability and the changes that Fioli has gone through with the changes in our climate. So, you know, I like to say that knowledge empowers people. It's with our most powerful tool the ability to think and decide. There is no power for change greater than a child discovering what he or she cares about. And as you will see in the upcoming program, Jim cares a lot about the environment and about Fioli and making it a better place. Thank you, Jim. Hello, Woodside Arts. I'm Jim Salyers, Director of Horticulture at Fioli. And when I was asked to do a presentation to give you an update on what is happening at Filoli. Um, I thought a good topic would be um, our efforts and our thinking about sustainability these days. Um, I've given iterations of this talk, much shorter version um, that I called Notes on Sustainability and Climate Change. Um, so that's, that's what I wanna talk about today. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. I'll let you know that I'm doing this on a Saturday morning. Um, there are turkeys around. Um, there is an event set up that might be happening a little later on in the program and there may be noise in the background. I don't know who's gonna wander by. I'm trying to do this super early so that I don't get interrupted and um, I don't break my train of thought uh, because of other things going on. But um, just know that there's a chance that there may be interruptions along the way. Um, we'll try to edit those out. Um, but um, you never know what's going to happen. The sun may came out, come out eventually as I'm doing these shorter videos. It'll be knitted together into the presentation you're seeing now. Um, so uh, one of the things that uh, has really brought the conversation about climate change to the forefront um, beyond um, all the things that we're talking about uh, has been this last storm year and the impact of the storms that hit Filoli. And I'll talk more about that um, in a little bit. But um, it's really uh, caused me to um, start thinking more deeply about this and what, uh, what is going to happen in the future. So um, just a little bit background about Filoli and uh, the garden that William and Agnes Bourne created. It was really met, uh, created as a uh, garden that um, had um, no limits on it. Um, William Bourne was president of the Spring Valley Water Company. He was um, uh, ha was at at one point the richest person in California, and um, and so he could throw all the resources in the world into this project. He did um, really think of this garden as um, being an English garden um, with lush grounds um, and, uh, and with plants that originated in, from England and Europe and other parts of the world as well, um, but all plants that, that were heavy water users. Um, there was one consideration where um, water conservation was a little bit more friend of mine, which I'll also talk about later, but um, for the most part this garden was created with no no bounds, um, and initially, he um, no, knew that he needed to somehow uh, create a resource of water on the property. So, a uh, dam was built um, up the property, um, and and then that dammed up uh, what's known as Crystal Springs Creek, uh, and 
that was the original source of water and, and uh, once that reservoir was built um, piping was uh, was created to take it down to water tanks which then fed the garden uh, but he learned in not too short a time that uh, uh, that that wasn't enough water for this garden um, especially as it was growing so um, his next idea um, talking to, to the people that he worked with his consultants and things like that was that he needed to um, dig wells on the property and upwards of uh, 30 different locations were drilled to see ab about uh, their potential for water but in the end uh, only five of those were productive enough to uh, tap into and use regularly and um, so for a while there were five wells on the property and finally became part of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. There were um, just three of those that remain, and that's what we're drilling from now, although we have tapped into another well um, more recently in the last couple of years, and um, that is, is coming online as another source of water on the property. But we have the three wells, um, and then uh, flat, fast forward to the Roth era, they then brought water from Crystal Springs Reservoir, from. Uh, the water temple area to the property which was um, uh, a huge source of water and that today is our water for um, is our domestic water but is also um, supplements our irrigation water which our wells um, don't have enough capacity to uh, meet the demand for especially in the summer season so that's a little bit of the history of um, kind of the the resources and um, and putting and getting uh, this garden situated so that it it could grow lushly. Um, you know, in the boring time, the plants were still growing and they didn't need quite as much water. But as as this wa as this property developed and got bigger um, and the plants got bigger and plants were added, um, it really was necessary during the Roth time to add the uh, additional water. And then um, when finally became part of the National Trust, it then. Um, uh, in those early days in the years in the early 70s and the 80s is when fi when California experienced um, some of the the beginning of some of the modern droughts that we've experienced um, uh, there were years in the 70s and years in the 80s when uh, water is really low and that was uh, uh, brought brought about a call to action to do something about the irrigation uh, originally historically through the, the um, 80s this wa this garden was irrigated completely by hand um, we have these things called watering horses that have a fan um, spray nozzle that goes on a hose and those were moved all around the garden to water everything uh, and um, in the summer um, the lore is, is that the, the horticulture staff would spend two full days just moving the water horses around um, that's all they would do they would go from one end of their section move the horses and proceed to move them all the way through and then circle back and start over again um, and that would take two full days for all the staff who worked here um, so uh, not only was that a, a huge time uh, uh, issue for horticulture but also um, that's not an efficient way to water your garden there's a lot of overspray there's a lot of things uh, you know in 20 minutes or half an hour or whatever it took to run through the whole course some things were going to be um, irrigating too much and it was going to be too wet uh, and, and you're going to be wasting water so that's when finally embarked on uh, putting in a, a more modern irrigation system so in two phases in the 80s and the early 90s um, this garden was completely dug up and irrigation systems were added to the lawns to all the beds uh, all the annual beds all the uh, shrub borders um, throughout the formal garden uh, irrigation was added and that really allowed us to um, um, have uh, put just enough water down um, and, uh, and and not too much n no, no extra um, and that was a huge savings on water for this garden and we continue to um, use that system and monitor that system and we're looking to update that system in the, in the near future hopefully to uh, use smart controllers which um, have a phone capability and can be shut off if there's a rain event um, and um, in lots of ways uh, have a more even even more efficient water system for the future so um, that is uh, hopefully the future of our irrigation and um, but there are other things that we're looking to do 
in the future to cut back on water um, and and then eventually um, uh, be using even less water, um, ideally. So I'm now standing in Father Lee's Woodland Garden and um, we've called it the Woodland Garden uh, since the, the time of um, Father Lee becoming part of the National Trust. Um, but originally this garden was designed to be a wild garden. And um, the difference between a woodland garden and a wild garden, um, a woodland garden is pretty self-explanatory. Um, it has tall trees, it has uh, shade loving plants um, throughout. Um, it has that feeling of being in the woods, um, a little bit more wet, uh, a little bit more lush. Um, and uh, that's what our modern woodland garden is. Um, there are camellias and rhododendrons and lots of different ferns and hellebores and uh, lots of other understory plants that like a little water or, or a fair amount of water. Um, originally, this part of the garden was designed as a wild garden. And a wild garden um, is meant to be uh, a place in a garden, um, often on the edge of the garden, where native plants, plants native to the site, are used in a more of a formal way. And so that's what this garden um, set out to be originally. Um, and that um, conversation and um, information about, about uh, wild gardens uh, was started by um, uh, a plantsman named William Robinson. Um, and he wrote a book called The Wild Garden, and um, it talked about um, making gardens out of uh, regional plants, native plants, um, and uh, he was also very much an advocate for um, uh, looking away from the Victorian era um, uh, design aesthetic that included um, using a lot of bedding plants, a lot of plants that required a lot of input, um, a lot of extra water and things like that. And so um, this garden was uh, planned to be a wild garden um, and so it originally would have had the, um, the oaks and ferns and um, maybe some of our other local natives, but that's it. Um, and then um, the oaks presumably at the time when the garden was, um, was originally constructed were smaller, um, there was more sun, um, and um, you know maybe there was some other color in here. Um, we don't we don't have any records, but when Mrs. Roth uh, and the Roth family were here, uh, Mrs. Roth uh, loved camellias. She loved rhododendrons. She loved um, the the type of woodland plants that um, uh, require more water. And so dozens of camellias, um, dozens of rhododendrons and azaleas were added to the, the woodland garden. And so now it has become part of the garden that um, requires a lot of water. Uh, and we are um, trying to figure out what this garden should be and should become. And one of the considerations is that we, uh, we remove all the camellias, move them to the western wall garden where there is um, already a, a considerable um, portion of the camellia collection already. And, um, still maintain uh, a sizable camellia collection, but um, put them all in one location and then return this back to uh, a wild garden. Um, part of that could be accomplished by just turning, turning the water down or off. Um, a number of these plants that are in here now don't need as much water, but um, it could also um, be that we start removing some of the, the other things that have been added over the years and bring it back to natives. And there are, there are still a number of natives, a number number of native ferns. Um, we have uh, the native Vancouveria, um, which is a low perennial that um, is in the barberry family that um, flowers and has beautiful leaves. Um, there's wild ginger, which is um, native to this property. Um, so there are things in here that are uh, much more, much less water requiring and we could um, uh, focus on those and then also add additional um, plants that uh, don't need as much water and um, make it just as exciting and lush um, but with a palette of plants that are native to the site, native to California, 
um, more likely and, um, and are still exciting. So I am now standing in um, what we call the garden, garden orchard um, or the family orchard. And uh, this is the orchard that is up in the production or panel gardens and uh, has uh, a, a wonderful collection of apples and pears um, and other fruit trees that um, uh, are a segment of the collection of fruit that we have um, that also includes um, our seven acre gentleman's orchard, which is down below the parking lot. Um, and that gentleman's orchard actually all the, ran all the way from the west, the east edge of the property up to the, the mansion where the um, olive grove is. Fruit trees, our fruit collection is our biggest collection here at Filoli and uh, one that we really celebrate in lots of ways through our Orchard Days event and um, which runs from mid uh, September through the end of October um, where our, our gentleman's orchard is open. There are um, uh, things for kids to do, there's a bar, there's food, um, all kinds of fun stuff and just a, a great opportunity to walk the orchard and uh, see some of the collection and learn about it. We have uh, interpretive signs out there to, to talk about some of the special varieties that we have. Um, but the reason uh, that the um, orchards and the fruit collection fit into this conversation about um, climate change and global warming and um, how that will impact the fruit collection that we have. And um, it has um, already in some ways and that um, disease pressure has increased. And so um, behind me um, are a number of peach trees um, here in the, the garden orchard and um, our plan is to remove those. Um, those trees um, are highly prone to disease in our climate, um, in particular peach leaf curl. Um, we've tried addressing it um, through the use of organic pesticides and um, organic fungicides and it hasn't worked. And so we um, are gonna move on in this formal part of the garden um, from a peach collection to other, other types of fruit trees. Um, but more broadly, um, the impact of climate change and global warming is that um, many trees, many, uh, many temperate plants, most temperate plants um, have something um, uh, called a chill requirement. And uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more with some other collections that we have. But um, where what uh, a chill requirement is, is it is a number of hours um, around 40 degrees um, that a plant needs to experience once it's gone dormant in the fall, once it's dropped its leaves and it's just a, 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 bare, a bare tree or shrub or a perennial, um, uh, the number of hours that it requires before um, it has been triggered to wake up and start um, growing again, flowering and fruiting. And um, this garden uh, is one that is in a microclimate for the, the Bay Area and for the peninsula where um, we uh, are typically colder than lots of, lots of the rest of the Bay Area. We ha will historically have had probably um, uh, 30 days um, in the the low 30s and, and 20s um, and many many more uh, days um, in the the low 40s and and, and lower so um, so it's those hours um, that uh, are required in order for the trees to break dormancy and flower and um, those hours are are reducing of the years. This this was a cold winter, um, and and there were there was no problem with chilling hours. But as things warm up, um, it's going to be more and more of an issue. And um, so let's say um, a tree requires a thousand hours um, uh, at forty degrees or or lower, and um, it's only getting six hundred. Um, what that means is that um, flowering can be delayed. Um, flowering can be um, less robust, and so there's less flowering and then less fruit. Um, it can mean that um, things are are flowering later, um, which then um, impacts um, other cycles um, with pollinators and things like that, that um, may affect um, how good of a fruit crop. Um, it can mean that things won't flower at all. Um, uh, for example, um, some, some perennials um, won't flower at all if they don't get enough chilling hours. Um, and uh, so 
Um, this is a, a collection within the garden that we're looking at um, what we have and what those chilling requirements are and um, how we can adapt the collection um, so that we still have this incredible collection of fruit, but it is um, more plants that need fewer chilling hours, um, persimmons, pomegranates, um, and uh, a whole host of uh, fruit trees that have been bred for warmer uh, climates that um, will do well, um, be disease resistant, and um, still give us um, that, that um, rich story about fruit uh, and the garden and um, how, much, how it has been uh, uh, an integral part of um, what this garden is, um, being a, an estate and a farm and something that uh, had production, um, but uh, tell it with, with different fruits. Um, so that's uh, something that we're looking at for the future. So uh, another place in the garden where uh, global warming um, can significantly impact uh, the, the displays and the collections that we have is here in the, the peony um, garden. Um, we have a collection of, uh, a small collection of herbaceous peonies. And uh, peonies are one of the reasons why guests come here uh, in the spring to see a plant that many people in the Bay Area can't grow because um, peonies are a plant that need a significant amount of cold uh, in the winter. Um, that is um, a little bit more easy to accomplish because they are underground and um, there's not the temperature fluctuations that happen with a tree in the sun. Um, but uh, this is a, a species of plant that needs uh, a lot of a lot of cold in order to uh, bloom well. Um, I'm sure most of you have visited the Midwest or the East or um, other parts of the world that have uh, a, a cold winter climate and peonies are just like weeds. They um, are these huge masses of plant um, with uh, dozens of flowers uh, in the spring. Um, they're in ditches, they're um, on driveways, they don't get any extra water, they don't need to get any extra attention and uh, they do great. Uh, but um, one of the things that makes this property special is that um, I talked about the microclimate that we are and we get more cold and that allows us to, to grow peonies. Um, it also allows us to grow lilacs, um, which are along this border here. Um, there are lilacs, uh, this is a lilac shrub here. Uh, lilacs are another plant that need a uh, fair amount of cold chilling in the winter. Um, they actually, some of them can do well in San Francisco because it stays cool in the in the winter um, and doesn't warm up as much. But other parts of the Bay Area where um, the winters are uh, warmer, um, they don't do well. There are um, varieties of lilac that have been bred for lower ch lower chilling requirements. Um, they're the Descanso series, and those are a great. Um, alternative, um, although they don't produce big shrubs like this. And again, people have seen in the Midwest and in the East and even in um, the Northwest, and uh, I can think of them in, being in Santa Fe, New Mexico and uh, other high desert areas where they get tons of cold, they don't need a, a ton of water, and uh, they bloom like crazy and are, are spectacular. So um, those are two examples of plants that may um, some day down the road be impacted by uh, warming temperatures and warmer winters and uh, may, may not work for us in the future. Um, the other big uh, display that is concerning is our tulip display. And uh, the, 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 the good news about tulips is that they can be um, put into a cooler and chilled and then um, go into the ground um, once, once things have really cooled down and perform well. But um, uh, there, there may reach a time when um, winters are too warm and even though we get them in the ground, we have uh, a warm spell and that will lead to the disaster of tulips. Uh, and that's happened uh, in the 28 years I've been here. That's ha that happened 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, actually, I was in the sunken garden, so it was before 2000. And what happened was um, we had 
a warm spell in the winter. The tulips, I think it was probably late January. And once the tulips have rooted and are established um, and they're getting extra cold chilling, if you get warm temperatures, um, it starts the tulip bulb uh, metabolizing and um, using up the energy that's in the uh, bulb to produce the nice tall flower. And the what happens is, is that the, the stem, the energy for uh, the growth of the tall stem on the tulip is lost and uh, we had tulips that were just sitting right on the surface of the, the ground. The, the flower was right there um, like some weird little succulent thing. Um, and uh, so, you know, that, that um, not to be all doom and gloom, but that is um, some reality of, of this garden eventually. And, and we, can, we can mitigate that through other ways. So th this is probably something much more down the line, depending on uh, how the Bay Area is impacted by climate change, but it could be something that we face here. And uh, daffodils are much more resilient. There are other bulbs that are much more resilient to, to warmer winters. And we, we may have to make that shift over time to using uh, bulbs that uh, can take uh, uh, warmer temperatures. But, um, but uh, in the meantime, I think our tulip display is safe. Our tulips are, um, uh, have been harvested in the Netherlands and are on their way and will be here in October and we'll get into planting them in November and December and we should have another beautiful spring next year. Um, but it's something, um, you know, it's just one of those other, one of those parts of the collection that we have to be thinking about and thinking about the future of and, and what um, may eventually become of it. So I want to tell you a little bit about um, one of the things that we've done in the last couple years to um, start talking more broadly about climate change and um, it all began last year with us planning a theme called blue gold the power and privilege of water and for that uh, we wanted to talk about um, all the ways that water was um, important and impactful and uh, historical to this property um, so that included um, the indigenous people who lived here and how important this property, this land, sorry, was um, for those people because of all the resources that it had, including um, lots of water running through it. Um, uh, there were other resources here that they utilized as well. The other um, part of that was the, the history of the Bourne family and their um, water, uh, owning the Spring Valley Water Company, um, and then the Roth family, and how they uh, had the Madison Shipping Company, and their um, their focus was also water related. So, um, so f there were lots of different stories that we told for that um, that theme, blue gold. Uh, but what in in the garden, we also wanted to um, use it as a platform to talk about um, drought and uh, water conservation. So, in the sunken garden where I'm standing now. Um, we wanted to do a display that focused on Mediterranean plants and um, so this garden represents all the Mediterranean regions of the world um, through the different plants here and the deserts um, and there are uh, uh, plants from California, there are plants from the Mediterranean basin, um, there are plants from Australia, Chile, and South Africa um, all here in the sunken garden. Really this garden came together with the um, through the availability of plants at um, nurseries throughout California, um, but it uh, as soon as it was installed, I knew that it was a, a display that we wanted to keep um, for at least a year, and we're going to keep it for a, a, another year beyond, and um, allow these uh, slower growing. Uh, perennials and woody plants and uh, succulents uh, have a couple extra years to fill in and uh, really um, start to shine and, and be even more and more beautiful um, in the next year. Uh, additionally, for the summer, we plant, or for the spring, we planted um, different native bulbs uh, in the sunken garden and uh, spring annuals, California native spring annuals were also planted here and they um, really um, created a beautiful uh, all-year display um, with with all these plants that are in this palette. But um, this is a little bit of a snapshot. Um, I'll be talking about the Lower Valley Street project um, later and what we're doing there, but it was an opportunity for us to 
used some plants that were not your typical phyllole uh, display plants. Um, but I think that the way that they're um, laid out in the garden um, uh, gives people um, some inspiration for their gardens to try some new things um, and try some things that uh, are appropriate for our Bay Area and Western United States landscape. And hopefully, um, uh, you know, it's it's the start of a movement. Um, the, the wet winter that we um, have just experienced um, makes people think, oh, we don't need to worry about uh, water conservation. Um, you know, it's dry some years, it's wet some years, it's fine. But that's not the case. And there are other things that are a shift uh, with our climate that will impact gardens. And um, these plants that are adapted to a drought, a dry landscape are much more adaptive to um, uh, wet years, dry years, warm years, um, and cool years. So um, it's, it's really an opportunity, hopefully for people to learn and um, shift their gardens um, to be more water conserving, um, but also still beautiful landscapes. So now I want to get back to what I talked about earlier in the program and what really brought uh, climate change uh, front of mind to me uh, more recently. And that was the 2022-2023 uh, storm season. And um, as many of you remember, um, being local, um, the rain started to fall on uh, the 31st um, early in the day. I don't know if it had even not rained that day. Um, uh, here at Filoli, we had had a power outage. Our holidays event was canceled for the day and ended up being canceled for the next few days. And, um, and uh, a tree came, the reason that the power went out was a tree came down and um, knocked out the power um, uh, where the leg comes in that then feeds the house and the visitor center. And <clears throat> we, um, uh, so as, as a resident on the property, um, I was checking on PG&E to see uh, how the work was progressing. I got up at once at midnight to check on them and uh, they were out looking for some parts that they needed. And then uh, about 5.30, 6 in the morning, it was just at, at, at dawn, uh, I came down to check on the power and see what was happening. The, the power... Uh, seemed to still be out um, when I checked our big breakers, but um, I uh, started walking the property. Um, actually, I came out of the house having checked the, the power and I heard a big tree come down and then um, proceeded to walk around the house into the garden to see if I could find where that tree was and discovered that the swimming pool had filled, overfilled, and the whole pool terrace was um, inches, had inches of water in it. Um, and uh, that was having already seen other locations where um, things had flooded. And, and then um, toward the property, um, and then as other staff came on, uh, we all got into um, trying to address um, the water moving on the property and uh, the flooding that was happening and uh, trees were coming down. Um, and so uh, we um, spent all day um, opening up culverts, um, getting things to dr try to drain. Uh, the, uh, the 2022 oak season was also what's known as a mast year and the the acorns um, had fallen and had clogged a lot of drains and so they um, contributed to the problem of uh, culverts being blocked. So that was uh, a lot of work just getting those um, opened up so that the water would flow and um, flow off property. But there were there were floods everywhere and um, <clears throat> uh, we lost um, a few trees that day. Um, but then, as you know, this this season just kept going. Um, the The next day on um, New Year's Day, um, touring the property, we discovered that um, the reservoir um, that I talked about at the beginning of the program um, had uh, been f filled up with uh, a mud flow. Um, and so, um, to this day, the reservoir is now just a stream that goes through it. It, it no longer holds any water, um, which was. Uh, 
an incredible shock to see. And then um, uh, in the next couple days, we discovered um, when the power came back on that our, um, our greenhouses weren't heating up, um, but found out that our boiler um, had been flooded um, during that initial huge storm and um, had uh, had been um, killed. Um, it was it was dead, uh, and it was actually a, a fairly brand new boiler that we put in when we converted to diesel or from diesel to propane. So um, that was um, uh, devastating. And that was that was actually our our single biggest financial um, loss. Um, although insurance did cover that. Um, but moving through the storm season, as things had become super wet and um, we had the different wind events, we lost more trees. Um, I'm happy to say that the garden for the most part was um, un pretty much unscathed. Um, we had gravel shifting from paths that were on slopes and things like that. The new vegetable garden, um, the, the decomposed granite pathways um, were absolutely fine throughout. Um, so a well-constructed, uh, pathway system there. Um, but the one thing that we did lose was, um, if probably most of you remember the, the, the big oaks that were in the meadow here, we lost one of those trees last summer, um, summer of 2022. And then during the, one of the big wind events, um, the, the oak here tumbled over, um, and we had to take it out. Um, but all told we probably lost, um, 20 to 30 trees, mostly oaks on the property. And, um, and so, um, it, uh, has been a call to action in a lot of ways. Um, number one, getting this property fit for storm events like that in the future. Um, but also, um, we now know that, um, it's going to continue to change and it's going to continue to warm up. Um, we're going to have more storms like this. Um, and, um, uh, you know, they bring a lot of rain, but it's not a lot that we can necessarily store. Um, and so, we want to do our part um, to conserve um, energy and other resources um, because even though we had a wet year this year and we might have a wet year um, this coming winter, it's not going to be uh, wet like that every year and we need to be a garden that can be resilient um, in the face of uh, droughts and wet years and all the other things that climate change is bringing. So now I want to talk about one of the efforts that we are in the midst of um, doing here in the garden to reduce water uh, uh, in places where we can. And that is this border behind me, um, which is the, the lower balustrade border that wraps around the north and west side of the house. And additionally, up on the upper terrace of the house, um, the foundation bed that runs along the west side and the um, the upper balustrade bed, which is a narrow bed that runs along the um, uh, upper side of that those balusters there. Um, not here on the north side, where uh, which is behind me, but uh, on the west side um, is part of this project. And um, there are historic photos that we have from the Bourne and the Roth era where those borders were um, quite lush, but were made up of a palette of mostly Mediterranean plants, uh, mostly drought tolerant plants. Um, it wasn't a super dry garden, um, but it was uh, much less of a wet area, wet garden, um, which is the way we've been keeping it recently. Um, and so, uh, we um, have looked at those photos for years and um, have thought about what might um, become of those in the future. When COVID hit and um, st uh, guests were rerouted around the north side of the house and along the balustrade and didn't necessarily funnel in through the sunken garden, uh, that, that area became much more high profile. And then um, in the last couple years, we have worked on a project um, right up here, um, this is the ballroom behind me, um, creating the ballroom terrace, which uh, hopefully, um, if you haven't already, you'll be out to the garden sometime soon and can see this new beautiful bluestone terrace. Uh, we have uh, fixed the fountain that was broken for years and put in a, a filter system. And so it's, um, it's a, a beautiful uh, space for um, our internal things, just for people to hang out with benches and some new valley oak trees. And, um, 
Here's one of the valley oak trees that we put down on the lower terrace. There's another one over here that we added, and there's a big one on the upper terrace. Um, and so it's a it's a great space, um, and uh, it in itself was uh, a, a, a chance for us to take uh, some turf offline and um, put in a drought tolerant landscape around that. So through this whole process, um, we realized that it was time to address this border, which had gotten a little, um, uh, um, was not being, uh, was not a, a focus area. Um, the, the plants in the area were um, kind of a haphazard mix. There were some very, water loving things like camellias um, that are in the border. So we decided that we wanted to um, redo this, all these borders. And um, we thought that it would be a good opportunity because we've gotten into our master planning process to uh, start working with um, local designers uh, to see what their projects um, were like and uh, and maybe utilize them for other things as we um, grow this property and add things add amenities to the property so um, we put out an RFP a request for proposals um, to uh, probably 10 um, designers um, we had two finalists and then um, chose uh, a woman Jen DeGraff uh, of DeGraff Associates uh, to be the designer for this project and uh, we're about 90% there but the the whole idea of this border it, this this design is to create a border that uh, number one is a uh, reduction in water and so one of the uh, among other things uh, the among the the plant palette um, that's changing in this border one of the big the key things is also to replace the boxwood hedge um, on this north side and the lower side, um, wrapping around the west side of the house, and then um, uh, and then create a palette of plants um, that addresses the different sun exposures. Um, and um, and throughout these different borders, there's continuity uh, among them. So um, some of the plants that are being used, um, different varieties of. Um, uh, yarrow and um, uh, buckwheat, um, but uh, there'll be red buds, western red buds. Um, there are Mediterranean, there are plants from uh, Australia. Um, I'm not remembering the whole palette of things, but that is um, uh, all the plants are uh, ones that uh, require less water. Um, this will be an opportunity to, for us to um, convert this border to, to drip and um, use uh, less water, less resources, um, but also um, the, the palette uh, is, will result in a, a more lush, updated, um, and beautiful border um, for people to stroll and learn from and, um, and, uh, and really uh, update and um, make more beautiful this, this section of the garden. So in conclusion, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about what Philoli is doing um, in um, broader strokes to address sustainability. Um, sustainability was one of the goal pillars for our uh, 2018 to 23 strategic plan. Um, and uh, we are now working on our 2024 to 29 strategic plan and it is one of the pillars for that as well. Um, and we've we've made efforts over the years um, in um, a, a bringing on electric um, equipment for the garden, uh, edgers and or sorry, um, hedgers and uh, blowers and uh, string trimmers, um, string line trimmers, weed whackers um, that we use that are electric, um, chainsaws which have been great a great addition. Um, to our, our arsenal um, and uh, we have moved from diesel to propane um, for our greenhouse boiler um, still uh, a, uh, creates carbon emissions but is much less than diesel and um, um, other little way other ways that we have um, adapted to be a, a more sustainable um, organization um, but uh, 
we have really started to kick things into gear um, this year. And Philo has created a, a sustainability task force. Um, we've hired a part-time sustainability expert um, to work with us on um, our efforts. And uh, we have had a couple meetings um, and we're looking at what our total carbon footprint is for this organization. Um, excuse me, which is, um, you know, partly, uh, partly comes down to uh, the commute um, for staff coming in. That's one of the things that's measured for your carbon footprint, but also um, uh, the amount of fuel that we use and um, our electricity, which is actually all green, um, green sourced electricity through uh, hydroelectric and solar. So our electricity is actually uh, uh, not uh, considered for our carbon footprint, um, which the whole peninsula um, uses uh, green energy. And so, so that's, that's fantastic. Um, but um, uh, we're, um, so we're, we're doing a, an assessment and, um, you know, in the, in the coming months and years, we'll really get into the meat of doing more and more in, in the way of sustainability. Um, our executive director, Kara Newport, attended uh, COP27 in Egypt last year and came home with um, lots of incredible stories and ideas and um, is making uh, Philoli part of the international conversation about uh, climate change. Um, we are part of the International National Trust Organization, which is also collectively working on, uh, on sustainability. Um, so that includes the, the UK's National Trust, um, Australia's National Trust, and wherever there's a National Trust organization within a country, that um, body makes up the International National Trust Organization. And um, so many, many countries are working on uh, sustainability. Uh, we are part of the American Public Gardens Association uh, toolkit um, for sustainability, and um, we are part of the Climate Heritage Network um, as well. So, um, so we're we're partnering and um, working with peers um, to uh, bring more and more better practices in the arena of sustainability onto the property. Um, and uh, we're also doing that through our master planning. Um, and uh, we uh, employed the firms of Nelson Bird Waltz and uh, Architectural Resources Group to uh, uh, take us through our master planning. And so uh, sustainability was very much front of mind throughout that whole process. And uh, so some of the future of Filoli and um, ways in which it will become more sustainable include um, taking turf offline, um, addressing um, sections of the garden to become more um, drought, uh, drought tolerant, drought, uh, uh, climate resist, climate resilient, um, and, uh, and then also um, uh, there will be a new parking lot as part of this project, and um, when that new parking lot is created, um, what is now the the guest parking lot here at Farlowly will become uh, returned to orchard, which is, as I mentioned earlier, what it originally was, um, an orchard from um, the olive orchard that is in front of the house all the way down to the gentleman's orchard. So it was one continuous gentleman's orchard. Um, from the house to the greater orchard. Originally it was 10 acres um, and so it'll return to almost almost that uh, acreage in the future. Um, but we're also looking at um, sustainability in the way of infrastructure. Um, we have a new natural lands um, uh, position uh, person on staff and looking at the greater property and what we can do to um, enhance the, the the native areas on the property. Um, by creating biodiversity um, and managing ecosystems, um, trying to get in there and get out the noxious weeds that we have on the property that have invaded from the garden and from um, uh, the, the Bay Area generally, things that have come in and are uh, impacting the, the native plants. Um, we want to address those and get, get those out of here. Um, fire mitigation is also an incredibly important thing to us. Um, we want to protect um, this this um, cultural resource and uh, and uh, and and make it resilient to fire. Um, and so um, we're doing work to um, uh, remove trees from 
uh, roadways and other ways that could impact um, uh, the, the garden and the house and other resources on the property um, if there was a fire. Um, we're looking at, at creating uh, wildlife corridors. Um, so, so lots of different ways that we're looking at um, sustainability and uh, addressing climate change. Um, uh, we're looking to work with other public gardens in the Bay Area uh, to come up with uh, what our future plant palette might be um, in the wake of uh, warming temperatures. Um, so um, the Irish ewes you see behind me up here at the high place may be replaced with something that is adapted to uh, a warmer climate in the future. Um, as best we can, we want to preserve the, the structure and the design of this garden, but do it in a way, but, but um, that may entail um, choosing new plants, choosing different plants that, that can, can endure um, whatever climate change brings us. So um, I'm hoping that in the future, Fire Lily can be a resource for people locally, um, nationally and internationally um, to, to help them uh, work out how to make whatever place they're, um, wh wherever they're growing plants um, and, uh, and living um, to be more climate re resilient. Um, and uh, so I, I look forward to that future and uh, the work that we can do to, to help with that. Um, so with that, I thank you all um, for being here and uh, watching this presentation. Hopefully there wasn't too much um, background um, disturbance. Um, but uh, as, a, as I said at the beginning, a, a chance for you to um, learn more about what we're doing, um, see, a little, see some segments of the property, hear about some of the things that we're thinking about, and, um, and uh, hopefully making you part of that conversation. All right. I thank you all. Bye. Wow, that was amazing. It's hard to believe that Fioli has gone through all of those changes. And I feel I feel very good to know that there are people like Jim who are making sure that Fioli continues to be this incredible place for us to visit and to experience the environment the way that it should be. You know, I it's hard to believe that the original owners who envision and built Fioli ever had the words of climate change as sustainability in their vocabulary. It was not something they probably had to think about. But when you think about the devastating fire that recently occurred in Lahaina, it's a reminder about the power of climate change. Transform vegetation, extreme drought, and abnormally high winds causing intense fires there. Anyone who lives in this area or Northern California is certainly familiar with those. But I'm not a pessimist. I believe in the future. You know, love is active. It's not passive. It is our love for one another, for Mother Earth, for our fellow creatures that compels us to act on their behalf, the way Jim is acting on behalf of Fioli for all of us. And the last thing I'd like to leave you with regarding this is that one of my favorite quotes from Voltaire was, men argue, nature acts. And we've certainly seen that, just at, not just at Fioli, but everywhere in the world today. Now, thank you for joining us. Next week, we our next month, excuse me, next month we have something completely different. We've been staying kind of in natural history world for a while, but next month we begin a literary voyage with some local writers called Wordside, not Woodside, great little pun that they have there, but Wordside. So I hope you'll stay tuned next month and enjoy us. And in the meantime, take care of each other. You are important. Good night.